Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're gonna be talking about both chapters 10 and 11 today. And when working through chapter 10, we're starting to see essentially not every casual um, or treatment affects each group the same. And if you don't recognize this and handle it, it really could throw off your um, your 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 outcomes. Um, the example given is that in the case of a medicine that works well against cervical cancer, well, if you're somebody who does not have a cervix, um, no matter how well that treatment works, it's not going to change benefit you in that way because you don't there's nothing to see oh if you don't have a cervix it doesn't magically appear and get better so um if you assume that everyone it responds to the treatment effects exactly the same um, you're going to be introducing bias and also potentially um, with the confounding uh, variables where they where they impact both the dependent and independent variable uh, so I outlined uh, some various ones uh, for average treatment effects, which is kind of the gold standard of what the overall impact of the treatment effects are. So that's looking at the all everybody, how it was affected. Heterogeneous is where it's actually looking at the different individuals, the variation among them, and then conditional treatment effects, which is on specific characteristics. So if we looked at ATE in the case of the cervical cancer, and we did a a randomized uh, sample of men and women, we didn't uh, look at some of these other treatment effects, uh, heterogeneous or conditional, we would assume that even if it was 100% successful, that the best that we could get would be whatever the number of women that were in, or people who have cervix in the, uh, in the group. So Rather than typing them all out, I did find that the rules in section 10.3 did a really great job of actually um, kind of walking through each of those. And I think it'd be good for us to kind of think this through, but the, the basically the methods that were adjusted in here is you, you either can have randomized experiments um, and you could potentially adjust for, uh, for the confounding variables. So a regression adjustment is put in there. And he, he ends the chapter with basically saying, well, who cares? Why does this matter? Um, really, at the end of the day, we want to know what will happen if we intervene. And these effects change what we can infer about what happens based on the analysis. And so really trying to make sure that as we get into the toolbox, ways that we can, we didn't learn like how to actually like put this into uh, practice, but we learned about some of the concepts and ways that we could adjust it that we'll start exploring further into the next um, toolbox area. Was there anything on chapter 10 that you all um, wanted to call out that I know I went pretty high level on, on quick on that, but is there, uh, did you want to go through any of the variance treatment calculations on this one? Some reason I can't see you all, but I'll assume that silence means good because uh, I don't know what happened to my Zoom chat. Okay, nothing in the chat. Okay, so it looked cooler in print. Uh, that's what I've been reading through, but I wanted to highlight, and I'm sorry for the rule of thumb, but he calls them rules of thumb here. And this is pretty much about which treatment variation do we allow to count? Um, and we can kind of think of some rules and the general guidelines, meaning that it's not always necessarily going to be perfectly like this, but they work most of the time. So the first one is if you have true randomization, you have an average treat treatment effect, no adjustments needed. So the data, you can uh, handle it that way. If the randomization only occurs with a specific group, then you can't just go with the average treatment effect. Um, you should 
consider isolating that group to get the full advantage of that randomization. So take out the men out of the medical study um, and look at just the women or people with who had a cervix and grab a randomization from that group that is uh, represented. Um, and that, not saying that men aren't impacted by the um, medicine. So maybe if they take it, they grow long hair all overnight or something. Um, that's just not uh, what we're looking for the effect of here. So it's not necessarily that we're just telling all the guys to leave or it's not beneficial to see it. Um, it's just that it's not able to answer um, how well this medicine does in treating cervical cancer. Uh, so at that point, if looking back at the back doors, which we talked about a few weeks ago and kind of closing those, then we kind of have that weighted average treatment effect, um, which kind of glossed over there, but there are ways that we could kind of see which of the subsample and kind of control of that. And then basically explaining the variation or the weights of those obser observations. Um, and that one is basically saying that each individual's treatment effect is weighted differently. Okay. Number four, basically, if you're assuming the untreated group is what the a treated group would look like if they hadn't been treated, then you can use the ATT, which is the average treatment on the treated, which basically measures the effect among those who actually received the treatment in your study. So if you had a group in went with one of the tests that we talk about in chapter 11, which is like the placebo, and you spent, gave half the people fifth uh, the medicine treatment, the other one not, then we're going to look uh, at the treatment effect on the ones that actually received the treatment. Okay, exogenous variables, if that's part of the um, treatment, treatment, then we can just isolate the specific impact by that variable. And that's a local average treatment effect. And really, it's the weights in that calculation are based on how much more treatment an individual will get if assigned to treatment than if they weren't assigned to the treatment. So uh, how, how impactful was the treatment in that situation? And that's late. And yep. So he does bring up a good point here at the end, which is that it's not always going to be the straight cut and dry. Some things work, but it's a good guideline to check to make sure that you are handling the different uh, very, uh, treatment effects accordingly to what is going on. Uh, he also mentions this here is that um, the research design isn't the only thing that can determine the treatment effect average. Um, so the way you estimate is also very important. So you could design the research properly and handle this here, uh, but if you don't select the um, right um, estimate here, uh, you, you will uh, be off. All right, any questions, anything anyone wants to add on chapter 10 before we move to chapter 11? Oh, hey, Aaron, I didn't see you joined. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, we were just, I didn't see, uh, know at what point you joined, but we just uh, kind of were going through a high level overview of chapter 10 and the mm -hmm. key points. And then we'll, we'll, we were going to uh, go to chapter 11 and then work through some of the problems uh, to kind of make sure we fully, was there anything out of this chapter you wanted to add or thoughts as you were going? I, I'm not sure what time you joined in. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if there's anything specific uh, uh, at this time treatment effect thing is interesting to me um i'm thinking it like an example there that we talked through i think a week or two ago uh where there's like the charter schools and there you know there's a lottery uh which 
tells you whether or not you kind of get in. And um, I, I think that's just, just an example of that, right? Where that's the exogenous variable is this, this lottery. And so you're, you end up measuring the effect on uh, folks that are participating in the, in the lottery. It's not, The, the necessarily the wider population and then it, it, it gets challenging too because right i think i talked about this last week like there there are folks that maybe win the lottery but the, then decide to still not to go to charter school and then there are folks that don't win the lottery and still somehow end up going to the charter school so you're really only measuring the effect on the folks that compl they call compliers right mm -hmm. where It's it's like they're obedient to the, to the lottery process. They they go to the charter school if they win the lottery. They don't if they lose. So it's not necessarily representative of the pop the full population that you're interested in. But it's you know sometimes the best you're going to do given given right. that natural randomized kind of you know exogenous variable that you have at your disposal. Yeah. How you explained that kind of re reminded me of the other club that we're in with the practical deep learning about the um, latent uh, factors and basically the movies that if you like a certain genre, even if you that movie was a genre, you didn't like it, or even if you hated a certain genre, the movie was still good. You would watch it, go out of your way to watch it. It's kind of uh, kind of remind me of that hmm. one. But yeah, I know different but um yeah that, that uh that's a good point on explaining on that is that it's you know we have to work with the data that we have and but it's you know part of going move into the chapter 11 is you know we could you know work with these complex ones of all the way uh all the ways that we can put assumptions in but we don't necessarily need that full complex uh model we just need to work on um our assumptions that we can control for and part of that process really is to think about, okay, treatment outcome in a backdoor and some stuff. Like it could start very basic on here's the treatment, here's the outcome backdoor. And you can basically fill in some stuff that you think is important, related, uh, um, imp uh, and so on. And really you're trying to find factors from that stuff um, in that data generating process. And the interesting thing here, uh, he mentions that controls removing variation explained by a variable is that once we have this list, we're not actually using this list like we did before and putting them into um, our DAGs and working through that. Really what we're looking for is looking through that list, what are these items or I guess it's funny factors could we control? And if there's not one that we think that we can control, then we have to think harder for another assumption variable that we can control for. And the whole goal on this is, yeah, you can think of every possible impact of something and maybe how it's related. But if you actually have a, uh, one control that is easy to measure and closes uh, the most back doors, that is more helpful than having a lot of ones that are harder to measure, can't be measured, and they don't necessarily uh, achieve as much uh, with the back doors. Uh, so one of the, this leads kind of into control groups. Um, you know, there's particular comparisons where control and the treatment are the same. And to your point of being wrong is not necessarily a bad thing, um, but it's a lot easier to determine how wrong you are or um, by with data checks, if you can actually do it. So just start working through uh, kind of simplifying these to randomization. Natural experiments are ways that uh, kind of can start uh, picking those out. And then it goes into some tests that are some ways that we can check for um, using data rather than theory, which is robust, robustness test. And can we disprove an assumption? Yes or no? Or, or sorry, it's two options here. Um, re is we can check whether we can disprove an assumption or two, redoing our analysis in a way that doesn't rely on 
apologize. I, I'm not sure if you heard Aaron, but my uh, cat knocked over a bunch of water. So my uh, um, finding what keyboards and stuff were not working when I uh, was going through this um, on that assumption and seeing if the results changed. That's the two uh, components of a, the robustness test, one, one of those. And then, you know, what we're getting towards is analyzing assumptions and what is observed, uh, what are the observable non-relationships that we're seeing there. Um, a placebo test, uh, probably most widely known, uh, uh, where you kind of basically weed out some of these bad assumptions. Uh, you, you give some people the treatment, some people not, and see if there's a uh, difference between them. There's also this concept of partial identification, which allows us to, let's go back to my note here. Um, prove whether the assumption is true or false, um, but more on not so wrong as to cause problem or too wrong to work with. And that's where this comes in is that instead of giving one specific value, it's giving us a range of possible treatment effects that could uh, likely uh, occur there. And by, by having that range, you know, we can kind of see about how wrong we are. Or we're, yeah, we are wrong, but not enough to cause a problem. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he likens it to, to, to uh, sensitivity testing, right? I, yeah. There's like a footnote about that, but I guess they're not exactly the same. But the idea is, right, you, you, those those assumptions that you're very confident about, you kind of have those as a, just a simple deterministic assumption in there. And then you vary some of the other assumptions that you're not as um, uh, sure about, right? And you kind of see what falls out at the end uh, to see, you know, if, if you're trying to measure an effect you know, is it, is it practically, you know, much different, um, based on those, those altered assumptions. So it's just, it feels like more of a, a gut check thing, right? Yeah. Which is the final defense. Uh, but yeah, to, to your point, uh, if that range is wider and you need to be more narrow, you could add assumptions to narrow that range, um, to, to hone in on it. Um, and it, it I, I now see the footnote that you were uh, seeking. I was right above where I was looking before. Um, so the last end point is your gut last line of defense. Do you feel like this could possibly ever be? Um, you know, if, if it seems like very unlikely or does makes no sense based off of your own context, research, um, everything that's out there, if your gut's kind of feeling off about it, there's probably something to um, to look further into on, uh, uh, com before you go publish papers and expect a Nobel Prize. Uh, questions, anything else you want to add on chapter 11 before we kind of talk through some of the um, questions, chapter 10? No, sorry, yeah, for chapter 10. Uh, no, just just comments that you know it was a little frustrating early in, in chapter eleven, right? I mean, the the point is kind of like, well, yeah, DAGs are useful, but at the end of the day, <laughs> for a lot of problems, you're you're not going to be able to really come up with a realistic diagram. And so there are different approaches, right, where you don't necessarily have to worry about all that. But he's saying it's still useful, right, to to think through. Um, I thought that was kind of an interesting example with like. If you're controlling with for where uh, an individual lives, like the house, right? And you're maybe looking at multiple siblings in the same house, you're also controlling for other variables. So there's kind of like a dominoes thing happening. So I think his point was you don't necessarily have to account for everything, but it, it's almost like his point was in a lot of cases, the DAG is just giving you a structured way to think, but at the end of the day, you might not actually use it at all. <laughs> it's yeah. Just, I went Sorry, go ahead. No, and I think that's, you know, we, we talked in prior meetings that, you know, there's a lot of causal analysis out there that doesn't rely on DAGs at all. And I, I think for, for some folks, this was like a brand new concept, not that I'm, you know, an, an expert in it, but I've certainly been exposed to it before, but you don't necessarily need the DAG <laughs> to, to do so much of this work. And we've spent many weeks at this point, 
really working through through those DAGs. Um, and so it, it feels almost like there's this conceptual thing to help us, you know, guide us with our research questions, sniff test things. But at the end of the day, <laughs> you know, it, it sounds like we're not going to be using this a lot you know, right. It, it's not required yeah. for the, the actual statistical approach that we're, we're taking to measure the effect. Right. It, it kind of reminded me of like a stereotypical, like you enter a math class and they're like, everything you learned last year, forget about it. We're going to be doing it this way. And it's kind of like, that's what we're saying here. Like when I got to that point too, it was like, um, so everything we had done prior, yeah, we're not going to do it in this case. That's, it, 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 it was subtle because he was just like, yeah, the difference is that we're just not going to use them like we did before. But yeah, I agree with you. It was like, you know, and I, I do think it, if the, he started off with this more basic one, it would have been very hard from entering into this book, talking about like the, every possible thing that we could think of and going immediately to narrowing it down to something. Cause at least we, by doing that, as he mentions that we have that starting point that we can then go from and understanding like you know what is the ideal situation where we can measure it easily and it has the most uh back doors that can close is really there and i think that would have probably been ch a challenge if we skipped over the importance of at least narrowing it down to see the whole picture first or not whole picture but the more extended ones but i I do like the simplistic models with like why make them more complex and robust if they don't necessarily need to be if as long as we have something that can uh, be usable here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like always just, you know, he, uh, he, the author beats around the bush about a lot of stuff, uh, like deliberately trying not to get technical, but I think that it can be frustrating at times too. Like he talks about the variance weighting and I think, you know, like, like, I think we're going to talk in a couple of weeks about inverse probability of treatment weighting, which is pretty common with, with like matching. Um, but he doesn't outright say it. <laughs> and he alludes to a lot of these methods, like, diff uh, what is it? Um, difference and differences where you, um, yeah, you kind of look at changes over time between two populations rather than trying to, you know, explicitly adjust both populations. So they match just the changes should be similar if there was no treatment effect but he doesn't outright say it right <laughs> he just <laughs> it, it's it's been you know it's been a struggle like because i want to dig into it but it's like i don't know the last five or six weeks it's just been like teasers um yeah. to a, a lot of this stuff so um you know we're, we're we've covered 11 chapters now and um i think we're all probably ready to <laughs> To dig into the meat of uh of, of you know what these teasers are are uh, referring to. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's available on the the ebook or the website, but on the back of this book, one of the key features is an easy to read conversational tone, and I I liked it in the in the beginning, and I still like it. But yeah, there is a lot of like the you know we're kind of teasing you with it, but it is something that i feel like needed to go through but us doing over was we now we started like early J july so two months before we actually start learning how uh, we're actually applying it it is a bit of a challenge and i don't think yeah. normally it would be that spread out um otherwise it's half the book right oh yeah because this, this, end, this ended the first part of the book um uh, chapter 12 is where we start actually entering into the toolbox Awesome. Any uh, other thoughts before we go through this more? Yeah, I don't. I guess it doesn't say under here. I guess let me also ask: Is would it be helpful to go look through those uh, problem uh, homework problem questions, or do you all feel at a point that we can um, if we want to talk about other things, or maybe start kind of talking? thinking ahead into the toolbox area or anything as we close out the first um, half of the book when designing the design of research. I'd yeah, like to I... check out the homework if that's cool. Okay, yep. What did you want to say, Aaron? No, I was just gonna open it up to the, to the group to see. 
um, yeah, certainly, certainly we can, we can check through some of these. Let's do it. Yeah. And I think just because this was kind of where I, like I had to have the glossary and I really like that if you haven't had a uh, chance to really explore through that glossary in 10 point was a four, 10.5, but are all next to each other. It really, for me, I am somebody who like often like reads something and doesn't catch the subtle differences of like one word or two words. Uh, so sometimes it's like, uh, how's that different? It's because, you know, it's, it's treated versus untreated or something like that. But, um, but that's a, that's a great place. But does anyone want to um, kind of try to define in your own words or what you feel like has been helpful for understanding uh, either of these, or if you know of a application of it somewhere? Uh, sorry, let me make that bigger so you all can see. And that's the question one. So conditional average treatment effect. That's what controlling for another variable, right? So you have like a, our variable that we're interested in is X and that's equal to some constant times Y plus Z. So we would have the conditional average treatment effect of Y on X conditional on Z. Y interested in effect of Y, no, X effect oh, yes, on Y conditioned on Z. Um, anyone want to add to that or? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's, you know, the example, of course, with the cervical cancer treatment, I think is, is, a, is, is great there, right? Where yes. you're really interested on the, you're not interested on the, the impact on men. So you'd want to condition uh, that to a specific subpopulation. Yeah, um, exactly. So replacing X and Y is the me uh, medicine effect on cervical cancer conditioned on the fact that they have a cervix. Would that be the correct wording for that? Replacing X, Y, and Z. Yeah, I, th I think I think that sounds right. Okay. Any other? real world examples or things that you may have seen or read about that this could besides the uh, one provided in the book. We don't have to go too far onto that, but just if from your own background or anything, uh, that's fine. So average treatment on the treated and average treatment on the untreated. And using kind of the first one there is, would it be interested of the uh, effect of, or X is an effect on Y condition or uh, uh, condition that they receive the treatment? Basically, like, could we still use that conditioned on where the condition is whether or not they were treated or not? Or would that wording need to change? To, so, I'm always confused by this stuff because, like, how can there be a treatment on the untreated? Because, like, I mean, by definition, they're not treated, right? Yeah, I guess. I guess when I think about the prob uh, like probability, it's like. Um, impact given that they were treated um, rather than conditioned on. So given that they were treated. Um, and I, I think what it is, is it, it, it could be something like where, like if you had like a weight loss drug and half the people got it and half the people didn't, and just to say it was, they found that like the people who didn't take the drug lost about the same amount of weight doing the same kind of concepts that would kind of show like, it, you know, it's likely the, there's other effects going on there that is because of the medicine. Well, I, I you know, I, I struggle with this a bit as well. I mean, average treatment on the treated seems to make more sense to me than average treatment on the untreated. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I think the way the book describes it, and this makes sense, like you actually, you have the reality of folks that were treated with something, right? And then you try to 
control or find a similar population somehow, right? Statistically adjust, whatever. For, um, so they look like the treated population. Um, and, and then, you know, you take the difference and say that's that's your treatment effect. And so differentiating that from average treatment on the untreated is, is a little, little confusing. But so the average treatment on the untreated, for example, if we're thinking about a difference in differences thing, then that would be like the change for the control group from the first time period to the second time period, right? Mm -hmm. So it may, maybe is it looking, we're looking at it, it seems like it's a way that if we don't know, or we can't, or we don't know, uh, if we have a randomized way of doing this, that um, we could, or we could kind of help differentiate that so that if the people were treated and untreated, some may have, some may not have. Um, wondering if it's kind of useful in that situation, because he says here, um, it says, imagine that we can't randomize anything ourselves, but we happen to observe um, the effects. So due diligence, outcome is completely unrelated to the probability that they're treated or not. The, the way I'm kind of thinking about it as we talk through it, and I, I could be off base, but, you know, average treatment on the treated, it seems like you're adjusting the un untreated population to look like the actual treated population. Is it the case for C here, average treatment on the untreated, that you're adjusting your treated population statistically so that it looks like the untreated population? Is it, I, I, again, I'm, I'm just thinking of how I've handled these situations in the past, you know, where you're trying to make one population look like another. Is it just a difference of, which population you're adjusting because <laughs> it feels kind of like it might be does that does that makes sense yeah um i guess it's almost I, I guess we're maybe thinking of like um and uh, way out about it is like uh say you hiked up um to a four thousand foot mountain that's on the east coast but you start at sea level Whereas on the West Coast, you might be starting, you know, close to um, a mile up, um, and you are at a say, if, maybe you start at at the uh, a little bit closer. Like even though it's a taller mountain, your hike length may be only slightly more than the four thousand footer. So I think what it is is basically saying like, okay. Uh, the effect that we were able to see with the treatment and the effect of with the people or the people who were untreated that also, um, also had some sort of thing happen that we were testing for mm. um, that really the benefit isn't that we, that the, of the people who were treated, it was if those people were going to, let's just say be cured of cervical cancer on their own, or I guess, remission or go over it then really the medicine w wouldn't have actually been like they would have done it whether mm. or not the treatment was there but rather that the treatment also added the additional effect between it so it's basically like a baseline between mm. them and so to say oh yeah you know it, the treatment effect is you know, let's just say uh you know 75 percent or something well if if I guess it's like getting, getting, um, you know, like a, a paper cut, like, you know, if it came out with a, a bandaid, like maybe, yeah, maybe there are some people who that turns into something worse, but like, you know, does your, uh, treatment actually heal the, a paper cut? And for most people that kind of, uh, heals on its own. So it doesn't matter, but, um, mm. but if there are uh, situations where that does actually improve it somehow, there, there is something there. So I, I don't know, the way I was interpreting it, I think it's different than how you're describing it here, John. And so, again, I don't claim to be correct on this, but I think what you're saying is kind of like 
the case where there's a placebo effect, right? And and you're you're basically trying to take the difference of yeah we we saw improvement in this placebo group right for a drug, and we saw an improvement for a, a treated population as well. Um, yeah, and, and but that's, but the that's... way I was understanding the the treatment effect on the untreated is more of a counter counterfactual, not a placebo effect. Just this is what we would have seen had we actually treated this population, even though in reality we didn't. That so those are different things. Yeah, right? and, and, and yeah. Uh, okay, okay. I was uh, um, I was just going to highlight in this side note over here. Yeah. Um. This right here is exactly how he describes the placebo yeah. test, which is the treatment effect. I'm sorry, which one is it? I'm, a, I'm a, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to figure out from the in-text to in here exactly which one we saw. Um, yeah. So basically, you know, the having that control group and not, but... So basically, it, it, it does seem to come down to, you know, a lack of randomization or there was concerns around it that... Um, that basically you wouldn't need to believe that they would be different, but when you don't have that, there could potentially be um, a difference. Does that fit more in line with your approach on it or did I misunderstand how? Well, I, I'm thinking uh, in, in, in a re realistic situation, you know, there's no randomization. It's an observational type study. You're treated an unpo tr treated and untreated populations are always going to be different, right? So mm -hmm. there's some sort of statistical adjustment that needs to happen. Um, again, I, I come from the place where I've done matching in the past, so I always think about it in terms of matching, um, where you're you're trying to make one population look like another. Um, and, and so, again, if it, someone please correct me if, if my my thinking about this is is wrong, but when we talk about the the average treatment effect on the untreated, I, I'm thinking it's more of a counterfactual. Yes, we didn't actually treat them in reality, but if we did, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what we would expect. And again, yeah, it, it's a that's different- That's what we're trying a, to say here. It could be a, a different demographic makeup uh, you know, for that untreated population, for instance. Just That's one of one possibility, right? Of just the many variables that could, could come to play. Like your untreated population could be 65 and up folks, right? Mm. Um, in terms of age, whereas maybe your treated population tends to be uh, working age um, individuals. And so, you know, you might want to try to adjust one population uh, or the other to, to make them look more apples to apples. Yeah, I, I see that now. And pretty much what you said, your takeaway was is basically what this is, he mentions, we can't see what the untreated people are like when treated. So this is a way to, um, you know, set, uh, set up the conditions so that there's the same and we could then um, work on that. Uh, how would you, in the, in the um, example in the cervical cancer in the book, uh, if say we, we were looking at just the uh, people with cervical uh, cervixes, um, but we had to use this route what um what are some ways that we would set up conditions so that well yeah the effect is the same let's yeah in that case well you, like let's just say you're you're focused on women let's just exclude men right like that's yeah. not really even a discussion point i think it's kind of a silly example but um let's just say you know the folks that took the treatment tended to have more like stage cancer or you know so they had a mix of different stages of cancer but it was heavily concentrated in stage three whereas the folks that were untreated were more heavily weighted towards stage one or two um right so we run stage one and untreated was stage three yeah and it's okay. i you know i would assume that both groups would be heterogeneous but like the mix is different between the different stages of cancer hmm. and you know, maybe you're you're more interested in how this affects people that are later stage yeah, cancer or earlier stage cancer. And so, 
in my mind, you know, if you're just dealing with observational data, it's not random, not randomized. You'd want to adjust either population, <laughs> one or the other, depending on where you're, where you're trying to go with that. Anyway, I see John had to go. Um, Derek or Sarah, my my way off base with with how I'm thinking about this stuff. Don't mean to belabor this point here, but it is an interesting topic: the the untreated versus treated. Yeah, it's not so easy to wrap your head around it. Yeah, sorry, there's work being done, and I had to answer something real quick. I was still listening; I just couldn't respond if it came to. So I might have missed it. Uh, while we're discussing the distinction between untreated and placebo, because I'm wondering if placebo means still part of the study or something like that. I, I guess uh, in, in this specific example we're talking about, I'm not thinking placebo at all. Uh, I'm thinking of an observational study, right? If you were trying to figure out the impact of, of a a drug or something on a uh, for for folks that had cervical cancer you know maybe that's that's your population of interest um and you 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 can see folks that were treated uh with the drug and, and folks that weren't treated with the, the the drug but you know you can't just assume that those two populations are similar right and and in my simplified world it's just the mix of stages of cancer are the differentiating factors between the two. Yeah, it seems like when you have the randomization, this isn't necessarily- This is not, a, this is not an issue at all. Cause in reality, yeah. I mean, I think this was a point in the chapter was that you're typically, you really want to get that average treatment effect a lot of the times, but it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and looking back at the, the rules we proposed to see, um, yeah, AT uses. If you're identifying your effect by assuming that some untreated group is what the treated group would look like if they hadn't been treated, then we have the average treatment of the treated. Yeah. So in that case, again, my, my thought is that you adjust the untreated population statistically so that it, you know, is, is more representative of, of the treated population in terms of all the underlying characteristics. Right. So then that kind of gives you that counterfactual, some, a population that kind of looks like the treated population, but we know they didn't actually receive treatment. So, and, and, and simplifying it, then isn't that essentially what we're saying is that the people who did the benefit, the effect or the benefit that we saw of the treated, less what we were seeing with the untreated, what is that difference of what we would have seen? if the untreated uh, had received the treatment? Um, I'd have to think through that. I mean, I, I guess it, 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 it depends. I mean, it's just the counterfactuals are kind of going in different directions there, yes. right? So like basically saying that the cancer one's kind of hard for me because I, I don't fully know the stage, but let's just say it's a weight loss drug. Let's just say that the uh, treatment lost... Um, no, fifteen percent body mass, or I guess that's kind of high. Um, I don't know, ten pounds. Um, and the ones that were untreated lost you know, seven pounds. To answer, if the people had but, been see, treated, so this, is, this is where I get hung up because in my mind. No, the untreated population didn't lose seven pounds. They're just a, a, a separate population. They didn't take the treatment. There's Wait, no what I'm saying, like, there's, just there's also the... no placebo here. It's just, yeah, this is, but you're right. I guess if you're doing something like difference and differences, yeah, you could monitor this over time. Um, and maybe arbitrarily, like this group lost seven pounds doing so, nothing. So, so you're, you're, saying, you're saying that the untreated is not part of the experiment, that they're just the population that isn't actually in the treatment is that i'm yeah I, i'm thinking about this in the context of a uh, an observational study mm. um and just to, to bring this back to something i'm maybe more familiar with um in the context of insurance you know like a lot of uh medical insurance providers have a wellness program and you know there's there's always this desire to see like well did did the wellness program you know where you get like reduced premium for for hitting certain objectives maybe you know, ha having so many steps 
uh, in a day on average over a period of time, right? And you, you can't just look at like folks that participated in the wellness program and didn't to come up with the effect because those mm. there's some self-selection that goes on there right folks that participate in the wellness program and folks folks that don't so that's purely observational you, there's no experiment here um and and so it, i'm thinking if you wanted to get the average treatment effect of the treated in that case the folks that did participate in the wellness program you would have to adjust or this is one way to do it you would adjust the folks that didn't participate in such a way so that the the makeup kind of looks similar to the folks that actually did participate so maybe mm -hmm. in the perfect world the only difference was like age and sex right we're, we're just different between those two populations like maybe younger people participated in the wellness program older people didn't so you on average right but there's it's still kind of heterogeneous between the two populations so you'd want to adjust the the folks that didn't participate so they looked younger overall so you kind of upweight the folks that were younger in the untreated population so they look like the folks that actually did participate therefore you you know taking the difference between the the treated you know the folks that participated in the wellness and the adjusted folks that didn't participate that gets you the average treatment effect on the treated but you could also do that differently right the the folks that didn't participate in the wellness program they're, they're older on average. Um, so then you maybe want to statistically adjust the, 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 the wellness program participants so that they, they, you know, upweight the folks that were older that did participate, for instance, right? So then it, that the treated population looks like the untreated population. So then you're taking a difference there and that should be the average treatment effect on the untreated. Again, I could be, <laughs> I'm caveating, caveating this again, that I could be way off base, but that's how I'm, I'm, I'm viewing this. Um, it's just kind of like, which population are you really interested in? Knowing that in observational studies, like your treated and untreated populations might maybe look different in all kinds of kinds of ways. And so, you know, there's just various statistical tricks, methods out there, um, in an observational study that to try to get you there so that the two populations look similar so that you can do a true counterfactual because you can right because you only observe one reality but through through statistical adjustments you, the, the hope is that you're you're able to come up with that count, counterfactual We can we can move on if you want. Oh no no no! It, it, used up a lot of time it, on this. It, no, it, it, I'm I'm glad that we are having this conversation because you know when you when you are going through it, it's like oh yeah that, that makes sense. When as you start to think about it and how actually apply it, yeah it, it doesn't. So I'm glad we did. Um, we we'll just because we do only have about five minutes. Let's just see if there's because we actually did kind of talk about a bit of these already, but um, let's see if because. Oh, I guess I opened up chapter 10 oh, twice. Let me grab the other chapter here. About that. Um, and yeah, I guess another one would be, uh, um, you know, kind of talking about, since we were on the placebo, is how do, you know, what are the robustness tests, uh, placebo tests, and kind of the partial identification? But and that's more than what we can talk about with the next three minutes. But um, that does conclude our the first half of the book. Sarah, have you had a chance to start looking through chapter twelve and seeing if, like, will if we're going to be starting to see like doing these kind of tests and so on with the toolbox or? I haven't yeah. checked it out yet, no. Okay, yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, so what we decided, let me actually pull that up real quick before we uh, convene. And I think Aaron, uh, we, you were not here just yet when I was going over this, but what I've done so far um, is, and hopefully not breaking this, is up until 17, because I was off for some reason in, in my 
logic here. I thought that we would finish 16 and then go on the daylight savings um, break, but is I have, Sarah's on here a lot, but she's only presenting for two weeks, not three weeks. It's just that we're covering 12 and 13 next week and then 13, we're breaking that up in half. Uh, so matching is going to be the first two weeks in October, simulation the last two weeks, and then fixed fix. Around this point, we should have an idea of whether two weeks is enough, too much, too little, um, and then we can make the adjustments. But as you're looking forward, if you see something down here of interest and it's only one week, if I see your name there, I'll just add it for the both weeks. And you don't have to be available for both weeks if for some reason um, really interested, but you're not available, say the second week for that, you know, just let us know or let me know and we can you know, try to split that up between or work on that. So if it's something you really want to do, but you're available this week, but not this week, I, I don't want that to be a, um, a reason why you, you can't present it or involved. But, um, yeah. And I just say, I, I haven't like previewed all the future chapters, but yeah, regression and matching are definitely longer ones, both of them. So I think the the point is maybe we don't want to completely rush through yeah everything in in 13 so it's kind of like whatever makes sense i guess I, I i don't know is it is it half i don't i don't know um but let's you yeah. know whatever we get through in the hour i think is fine yeah and and this fixed effects because that my original intent was for that to start up after this one we could always potentially move this after if we need to extend one of these three out yeah uh, additional one um and where we're getting into is pushing out into a lot of the you know more heavy holidays and times and kind of thinking like for example we have this daylight savings which is which is fine but then there's like the Wednesday of Thanksgiving here in the U the U S which is like the highest travel day I'm not sure if that's something yeah and then of course as we get towards the holiday season I don't know all of the uh, holidays that people are impacted by but we just need to kind of look ahead to see which ones we may want to skip and that knowing that we're no longer finishing at the target of end of December, we're going to be targeting and um, sometime in January, but I'm in no rush. Um, as long as we're all getting something value of it, if, you know, we'll check in uh, as much as we can, but if the timing is too slow, too fast, or not getting enough, or you can't keep up, you know, just, you know, let, let it out there so that if we need to make adjustments, we can, so on. Um, and what yeah. I'll do. Oh, yeah, that go sounds ahead. good. And, and the day before Thanksgiving, um, I, you know, I probably won't be joining that one <laughs> yeah. if, if we want to move forward with that day. Cause yeah, it, it's a busy day. I don't, I don't even know uh, which day uh, Thanksgiving is this year. Is it the 21st or the 28th? Uh, oh. Well, we can figure that out real quick. Um, yeah. It's the 28th. That's where it's you the 28th. It. Okay. Yeah. So that would be uh, one of them. I don't know um, out by you, Sarah, if there's any specific dates that likely not, but I think three of us are here in the U S and I think Italy, um, you're in Germany. And then I think there was one person calling in from Africa that comes occasionally. So, uh, I can't remember. Was it Morocco? No. But yeah, so, um, there, and of course the recordings will be there, but awesome. Well, thank you all. We're right at the hour and, um, what I'll do, uh, I'll post next week, but I'll also mention that we're finally going into the toolbox next week. So hopefully the people who've been in and out or so on, um, you know, finally might be able to start joining in where we are actually diving de uh, into using this and um, the tools behind it. Well, it's great talking with everyone and um, we'll look forward to hearing from Sarah next week. I'm going to hit stop and have a great day. Sounds good. See you next week. See you next week. Bye-bye.